Amen. Thank you, Cindy. Beautifully sung. Beautiful song. God bless you. That was great. Wonderful message in the music there. Also, thank you, choir, for that beautiful song. Jeremy, I think you missed a great opportunity because, you know, we clapped before the song was over with. I, I wanted you to turn around and say, gotcha. <laughs> but uh, I thought that would have been perfect for you to do something like that. But anyway, uh, we're, we're so blessed with the wonderful music that we have. And Cliff, 12 years, do you say? And she's already left you. All right. When you all see Sarah, just tell her I have a message for her. Uh, that she doesn't even need to be saved to get into heaven. Uh, living with Cliff for 12 years qualifies as good works. Uh, all right. Then. Go ahead and open your Bible. So, sorry, Cliff, I'll, I'll make it up to you uh, this week. All right. Mark the seventh chapter. Mark the seventh chapter. On a serious note now, the uh, today across the nation uh, is being observed Sanctity of Life Sunday. And this is where we remember the tragedy of Roe versus Wade 44 years ago. Uh, our emphasis will be next Sunday. We're having a special testimony. Uh, I'll be preaching now, but we're going to have a special testimony that you don't want to miss next Sunday. And the only time the person could come and give this testimony was um, next Sunday. So, but we are going to be saying a word because we do stand for the, for the unborn. And... Um, I was told, tragically, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. I was told by the uh, leader, Jennifer Threadgill, who will be uh, giving a testimony. She's the leader of Confidential Care for Women. She said very few churches say anything on Sanctity of Life Sunday. I'm like, my goodness. No wonder the churches in America have a form of godliness that doesn't lead to the truth. So, uh, folks, we've got to, I'll guarantee you this, God remembers the unborn. Amen. He does. He does. So, our emphasis will be next Sunday, you don't want to miss. This lady, she is wonderful. She is absolutely wonderful. Um, Mark, the seventh chapter. I do want, I, I do want to say one other word. Uh, Eston. Um, your mom passed away. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. Your mother was a, she was, she was some kind of wonderful lady. I was glad to hear the testimonies that were given yesterday. Be sure and pray for Esther and his family and the loss of his mom. All right, <clears throat> we're at Mark, the seventh chapter. Let's look at verse 24. And this is the story that really will surprise you. If you've never really read it before, the first time I ever read it, I was shocked. <laughs> wow, Jesus, you're really being rude here. And uh, I didn't know what to make of it. And Jesus is not being rude. There's something else going on. You've got to, get, you've got to go in deeper. You can't just look at the surface. Below the, below the surface, there's wonderful jewels and diamonds and gold there. And we're going to try and unearth some of that. But at first read, it sounds like Jesus is really being rude. Let's, let's look and see what it says. It says that Jesus left the place. Now, he had been in the area of the Decapolis, and a lot of great miracles had been taking place. And the feeding of the 5,000, one of the great miracles, of course, and all kinds of people were following. I mean, if somebody was feeding you free, wouldn't you want to follow as well? They were saying, wow, no more farming, no more fishing, no more having to go into the fields. Uh, this is great. We want to follow him. So he had all kinds of people around him, and he needed to get away. This brings out the humanity of Jesus. He needed a little rest and relaxation, so he, he got away from there, and he went to the vicinity of Tyre. Now, Tyre is on the Mediterranean side, and it's actually outside of Israel, and it's right in what's called the, uh, today would be called southern Syria, uh, southern Lebanon. Back then it was a part of Syria. So that's where he is, a little R&R &R going on. And it says he entered the house, and they really didn't even want anybody to be there so that he could recuperate. And yet he could not keep his presence secret. And that's, just, that's just the way it is. When Jesus is really in the house, you can't keep it a secret. So verse 25 says this. In fact, as soon as she heard about him. Now who is this she that heard about him? We're going to find out. A woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit. Now, remember the word I've told you before, but just by way of reminder. Demons bring impure spirits. Why is there so much uncleanness and 
just gross immorality and decadence. You may say, well, those people aren't right. It's unclean spirits, impure spirits at work. These impure spirits came. Uh, this daughter was possessed, fell at his feet. And then in verse 26 it says this. The woman was a Greek, uh, born of a Syrian, a Phoenician. Uh, it says in uh, another translation, Syrophoenician, she, uh, which is a Canaanite. Okay, She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. And then here's what happened. Here's what Jesus told her. Well, first let the children eat all they want. Now, in Matthew's gospel, it says that she had been begging and she had been making quite a scene. In fact, the disciples came to Jesus and said, can't you do something with this woman? She won't be quiet. She, she insists on you doing something. And she gets in front of Jesus. And he said, why should we give bread? Shouldn't the, the children of Israel get the bread? He says, first let the children eat all they want, he told her. For it's not right to take children's bread and toss it to the dogs. He's, he is inferring that she is a dog. Now, Jewish people call people that are Gentiles dogs. Still goes on today, in fact. And it is a reference to the mangy critter that wanders out in the wilderness. So I think of a mangy critter like that. You toss it to the dogs? Well, then in verse 28 it says this. Lord, she replied, even the dogs. Now, it's a different word used here. For, it's little puppies. Even the, even the little puppies. Under the table, eat the children's crumbs. And then he said this. He told her such a reply, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. What a surprising passage of Scripture. Let's look at today, we're going to see about audacious faith. The audacity of faith, the word audacious, means to take bold risk. Audacious faith. It's to be daring even at the point of personal safety. This woman de demonstrated, not quiet, timid faith. She demonstrated audacious faith. Let's look at it today. What is the characteristic of it as found in this woman's life that Jesus responded in such a great way? Audacious faith is bold. Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, The righteous are as bold as a lion. Hebrews 4 16 says that uh, it's not in your outline, but write it down. It says that we are to come before the throne room of God with boldness. Just like you would walk into your parents' house and just sit right down and have conversation and tell your need. Ephesians 3.12 says, We have boldness and access and confidence through our faith in Him. She was bold in what she did. She just came and took great risk because she had several stripes against her. Strikes against her were this. Number one, she was not Jewish. She was a Gentile. I mean, she wasn't even half Jewish. If you're half Jewish, you're Samaritan. But she wasn't even qualified like that. She was a Canaanite. The Canaanites were the outcasts. They were the ones that had rebelled against God. She was outside of the faith. That's one strike against her. Number two, a woman was not to speak to a man in public unless there was her husband, father, or brother. So any of that, those two were just... They were just society taboos, and yet here she was breaking through both barriers. She was a woman on a mission. She wasn't going to be denied. Her daughter was in terrible shape. No one in the Canaanite religion had been able to help her, nor had any of the medicine people been able to help her, and yet she knew that help was on the way. She understood who Jesus was. How do we know that? Because in Matthew, it says something very, very important. As she's crying out, the disciples are saying, Jesus, do something. She, she kind of just breaks through and crashes the party and says, Son of David. That phrase, very, very important. Because the people around Jesus didn't necessarily get it. She got it. When she said, Son of David, what was she saying? She was saying, you're the Messiah. Uh, you're the one that... Your people talk about, you are the promised Messiah of God. She was confessing and professing her faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. When she said, Son of David, Jesus knew immediately he was saying this. She gets it. 
You know, it's possible to be all around Jesus and all around the music and all around the preaching and not get it at all. And that's what a lot of people were. They were all around Jesus. They weren't getting it, but she got it. She was bold in her faith. She was a woman on a mission. And you, you know about women on mission. You know when a woman gets something on her mind? You better get out of the way. Amen. I heard some men. Amen and man. When a woman's on a mission, the waters will part and you best get out of the way. These disciples, they were so stupid trying to, trying to stop this woman. <laughs> she was on a mission and she was bold. She said, I'm not going to be denied. And she could have she could have taken the insult. But she didn't. She didn't let the insult that Jesus gave stop her. She could have said, what are you doing? Call me a dog. You're a dog. I've been following your ministry and I've been getting your emails and I'm not contributing any more money to your ministry. I'm moving my membership somewhere else. You have hurt my feelings. But she was too bold to let something like that stand in her way. And what did she do? She said, hmm. All right, let's look at the second thing. Audacious faith doesn't stop when it's insulted. And I've already jumped into that part. She fought through the crowd. And on the surface, it looks like that Jesus is being very rude, but he's not. He's testing her. Is that right for Jesus to do that? Absolutely, it's right. Doesn't the Creator, doesn't the creator have the right to test the created one? I mean, we give tests all the time in our society. Doctors will give a test to you if, you're, if you come to him and you, or her and you're sick. Uh, in school, tests are being given. Someone makes application for job. Oftentimes, there are tests that have to be taken. On and on it goes. So, but we've got the idea that, that we should really put people to a test. We want everybody to be a winner. We want every child that participates in a sport to get a, a participation medal, never mind the fact that you hardly came to practice and you really didn't want to be on the team. But in order for all the parents to be happy, we have to give you a participation medal so everybody's entitled and everybody's happy. God help us. Oh, I know I've offended. You can apologize to me later. <laughs> I mean, you know... We, we feel, today we feel so entitled. Colleges today have safe zones where you can go and not hear anything that will just snowflake and you little snowflakes today, these little snowflakes, they, so they won't melt under any kind of criticism that will hurt them. But she was called a dog. And you know what she said in essence? She said, you're right. You're right. When Jesus speaks to us, we get the idea that it always ought to be comforting. Let me tell you something about the Holy Spirit. A lot of our songs, and I praise the Lord for them, they're all about the comfort of the Holy Spirit. But you know what I find is left out today? It's called the convictor of sin is the Holy Spirit as well. And before He can bring comfort, He has to bring conviction in order that the dead wood and the junk be gotten out of the way so the promise of the comfort can be brought to our lives. And until we agree with Him and say, God, you're right, the comfort can't come in behind it. This is what she was doing. She was saying, you're right. A prudent man, it says in Proverbs, ignores an insult and moves on past it. She said, God, you're right. We see the example of that in David. King David, he was guilty of adultery, lying, and murder. That's a bad rap sheet in case you don't know it. He thought he had gotten away with it, but Nathan the prophet comes to him and says, you're the man, you're guilty, and David does not say, who are you to insult me, the king? I can have you thrown in prison and silenced. But what did King David do? He said, you're right. I'm wrong. And this is why David was called a man after God's own heart. Folks, listen, the best prayer that you can pray oftentimes is this, God, you're right. Now, how hard is that? People say, I don't know how to pray. Start like this, God, you're right. And any other answer I have that's contrary to your will is wrong. You're right. So, 
Her faith was not stopped by the quote, quote, insult. Third thing we see about this woman is, oh, I love this part. In fact, I, I, I got to tell you, I, I just love this whole passage. I, I've just been so blessed by it. Grateful. Grateful for the crumbs. She didn't fold. This woman did not fold. She didn't say, well, I know. I know where, where, I know where I'm wanted, and it obviously is not here. Let me just take my let me just take myself out of here. I can see I'm not welcomed here as a visitor. And you folks must think that you're better than I am. But she didn't say that. You know, in essence, what she said was, she said, Look, Jesus, I know I don't deserve to be here. I get that. I understand that. I know I don't I know I don't deserve to be here. But could I just tell you I am so desperate. I will settle for the crumbs if you'll just give me the crumbs. That'll be enough. She didn't say my life is crummy. She didn't moan and complain. She said you're right. I don't deserve to be here, but Lord, I'll settle. I'll just settle for the crumbs. What do we do? We give our very best. We give our very best to the world, and we give our crumbs to God. And we think God ought to really be happy. I mean, you know, if you take a, if you take a broken fan and give it to goodwill, some of you think that the angels in heaven ought to be applauding. Wonderful. They're very blessed by that broken fan they're going to have to repair. Good for you. It's like, once again, everybody ought to be given a trophy. But she was grateful even for the crumbs. We ought to be giving our very best to the Lord. God has, listen, God has given His very best to us when He gave His Son, Jesus What do we deserve? Zero. And any crumb that we get, that's great. We ought to say thank you. Because we have been given an escape from the fires of hell and a promise one day of the joy of heaven. And in between that time, if it's crumbs we get, thank you, Jesus. Now, I know that doesn't fit today in a lot of the preaching that's going on. Where These are false teachers that Paul talked and said they are dogs. He said, beware false teachers, the dogs that are false teachers. Philippians, the third chapter, who say, you follow Jesus, you're going to be rich. You're always going to be healthy. And you're always going to have wonderful things that will come your way. A life of ease is on your way. That is a lie from hell. I didn't expect that to be popular. I'm, I'm sorry, but I read the Bible. I love what Cindy said. You can live a life, but you cannot have an abundant life without the Lord Jesus. There will be seasons of difficulty if you truly are a follower of Christ at times. You will have your faith tested. We're going to get to that in just a moment, but let me just say this about the crumbs. The Apostle Paul, it looked like he had a crummy life. He was put in prison, and when he wrote 1 Thessalonians 5.18, he said this, Give thanks in all circumstances. Where was he when he wrote this? He was in a dark prison. And... The prison cell meant that he was chained in a Roman dungeon. His his restroom was a corner. And the Romans were very good at torture. I mean, the crucifixion shows that. And they knew that one of the ways to torture a person was just to lock them up in a dungeon cell and allow only a sliver of light to come in. Because they knew that if you put a person in solitary confinement and also put them in complete darkness, they will go insane. They will. Any and everybody. Because there's not enough stimulation. The brain has to have stimulation. And the brain will just go insane. 
So they knew that if they allowed just a little bit of light, that that would keep the sanity so that they would be able to realize how horrible the conditions were. You see, if you go insane, then you don't know how bad things are. You just lost it all. So that would keep the sanity so that they could just constantly be reminded of how horrible the torture was. So here is Paul. Give thanks in all circumstances. He said this, I have learned whatever state I am in. I have learned that whatever comes my way, I have learned how to be rich. I've learned how to be poor. I've learned how to be hungry. I've learned how to be full. I've learned how to have much, and I've learned how to have less. I've learned all of this. I've learned in Philippians, he says, whatever state I am in, whether it's in a dungeon cell or preaching in the synagogue or out there sharing the gospel, I've learned any and everywhere, I've learned this. I've learned to be content in Christ. Because it's not what the world gives me that's enough. It's what he gives me that's enough. So audacious faith will be grateful for whatever God brings them. But I can tell you this, he's going to bring you a lot more than just the crumbs. The last thing is this. Audacious faith will pass the test because it's, it's clinging to Christ and Christ alone. Here's what it says in Matthew 15. She said to Jesus, Yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. She got it. (laughs) I mean, she just was. She wasn't going to be denied. Now, having your faith tested looks like one of two ways. More, but let me just show you two ways. You're going through a real time of testing, okay? And... Symbolically, you're, you're seated at the table. Your, your hands are in your head like this. And you're moaning and you're crying out to the Lord. Oh God, this is, this is a test that I need your strength. It's more than I can handle. And He will come to you. And Jesus sits beside you and He takes your hand and He looks you in the eyes and He says, I'm with you all the way. That's that peace and comfort that comes from above. Then there's another test, and Jesus comes like this. You're seated at the table. Your hands are in your head, and you're moaning and you're crying. And Jesus comes up to you. And you look up, and He takes the table, and He flips it over. And He says, get up. Well, that's rude. You're crying. Sometimes, you know what the Lord has to do to us? He has to flip the table. Sometimes he sits at the table with us, holds our hand. Other times he has to flip the table. You know why? Because sometimes we won't get up. All we want to do is just moan and groan about how horrible our circumstances are and how trapped we are and how the sun will never come out and that God has left us. And he comes up, he flips the table over, he knocks the chair over, and he says, get up, zip it. Moms, you ever say to your kids, all right, zip it, just zip it. Sometimes he has to just say, zip it. Your moaning and groaning ain't going to get you any victory. Having the self-pity party is not going to bring about the victory that you're needing. He's saying, zip it, get up, be a disciple, get up and follow me. Come on, enough. We must go. There are greater things to do. So, in a real practical way, how, how, how does that look? How does that look? Well, here's how it looks. You know, you're moaning and groaning. You've come to a real test. You've come to a real test in your life. And uh, how do you know if you've passed? Well... Did you quit? Did you quit? If you quit, you didn't pass. Quitters don't pass. So, if you quit, you didn't pass. God understands. God understands that you quit. The Bible says that there were many that turned away from Jesus and quit. 
Did they pass? No. So there are always these challenges in the Christian life. There's always the load that is greater than you can handle. There's always the times when at night, maybe you get up in the middle of the night, and you look out the window, and you say, I can't do this anymore. I quit. I can't go any longer. You haven't come through. And you quit. Or, it looks like this. I'm done. I'm done. Have you ever done that? I have. Now, if you haven't, please come counsel me. So what do you do when you quit? Well, you just... Well, here's what a lot of people do. They say, I quit, but I'm going to continue with my religious duties. I'm going to continue to be a good person. Christians are the best people. They're a whole lot better than pagans and those that follow other religions. So being a Christian is much better for my family and my, raising my children. But as far as me personally, I'm done. It has taken too long. It has been too difficult. And I've not seen any results in any time soon. So inside, I'm just going to say, I stop. Now, if you come to that point and you've shoved it all away, let me, let me ask you this. Is it worth it? No. No, it's not worth it. You see, audacious faith will pass the test. Here's what you've got to do. You've got to go back. Let's say it's at the window. Okay, in your prayer, you go back to the window, which is what I did one time. One night I got up and I looked out the window. I said, God, I quit. I'm done. But you know what? Two things. He wouldn't let me go and I realized it wasn't worth it to, to quit. But I did. I looked out the window and I said, I'm done. So what you do is, what I had to do is this. I had to go back to that window. I said, God, I'm sorry. I want to I wanna be back with you. I want to be back with you. And you know what he said? I know and I love you. I want you to come back. Or maybe, maybe you, you need to go back to that place uh, beside the, the table stand, uh, the, the nightstand beside the chair where you said, it ain't working. Go back in your heart and say, God, I, I want to come. I want to come back. And I, wanna, I want to be restored where I was. I want to be restored. And I want to know you like I once did. Listen, He is not going to chide you. He's going to welcome you. But He's not going to drag you back. What does the Bible say? Jesus said, come to Me. He's not about chasing us down. He says, come to Me. Now here in a practical way, this is what it might look like. When you say, alright Lord, I want to pass the test. I want to be audacious. Here's what it's going to look like. The test will be a test. And what God is doing is He's building a testimony. A testimony is no good if it's never been tested. So when you are tested, a testimony is being built. And here's how your testimony can be built. All right, you're married, you've got kids, you've turned away, you know, you're still being religious, coming to church, all that. How do you do it? Here's how you do it. You say, if for you it was that time where you closed your Bible and you said, okay, I, I'm, I'm done. You say, Lord, I'm walking out of here and I'm going to be close to you. I'm going to walk in your word like I once did. Here's, what, here's how it might look. Tomorrow morning, you get ready to go to work. The, the, uh, the guys at work give you a hard time. Maybe the boss gives you a hard time. You say, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with you, Lord Jesus, so I'm not going to let this get me down. You come home and you say, uh, man, I wanted to spend some time with the Lord in, in the word and prayer, but... Uh, the kids have got to go to practice and, and this, is, this has got to go this place and the wife needs me to do this and you've got all this to take care of. And then you, uh, then you have the meal and then you get the kids to bed. And then the wife says to you, you know, tonight is the night that we watch, we always watch our favorite TV program. 
And you know if you watch that TV program that you're going to be so tired, you're not going to feel like going along with the Lord in the Word and prayer. And so here's the test. What are you going to do? Well, let me tell you what you're going to do. You're going to say, Honey, I know I like, being, I like watching that program with you, but I'm going to spend time with the Word. And she may say, Oh, we're Mr. Spiritual now. Let, let me ask you a question. Has anybody ever heard of TiVo? Has anybody ever heard of uh, DVR? Netflix? Streaming? Live? You know, there's all these things available where you can record and watch it later. Here's what your wife needs more. She needs a godly man. She needs a godly husband. And you may be misunderstood, but you go to the Lord in prayer. And you say, I'm going to get back where I was. Now, where was it for you? Everybody's got a different place. Everybody's got a different time. But don't say it's too difficult, it takes too long, nothing is happening, I've got to make my own plans. You come back to the Lord today. Today is the day to return to Him. And you can do that starting, you can do that starting right now. Would you? All right, let's pray right now. You can do that right now by saying, Lord, I return. Lord, I return to you like the prodigal son returned. Like, like Peter, when he returned back to Jesus after he denied him. And, and many others. Any and everyone can. But would you let the Holy Spirit... Would you listen? Listen, the Holy Spirit brings conviction that hurts, but that hurt also brings healing. So don't run away from it. Embrace it because you know that it is better. So here's what I want to challenge you to do and ask you to do. Would you go to someone... Would you go to someone in authority in your life? Maybe it is your wife or your husband, you know, your partners. Maybe it is a parent. Maybe it is uh, a leader in the church, a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it's one of the pastors here. Maybe it's uh, a trusted friend. But go to them and say, I am coming back to Jesus. It does not help you to keep it silent. Sure, you can have inward commitments, but outward statements have far more power. So today, would you make a commitment to make it public? Make it public to your Sunday school class. Make it public to this church. Make it public to a family member, but to make a public statement of commitment, I'm coming back. I'm going to be bold in this statement. I want to be held accountable. Listen, folks, time is too short. Would you today, if God's saying to you today to come and recommit your life and to stand before the church and ask for that, then, then God bless you, but let's do business with Him. God speaking to your heart about salvation. I'll get saved right here in my chair. Well, you, that's good, but if you're going to be saved, as Jesus said, let it be known publicly. He said, you don't deny me before men. You can't do that. So to deny Him before men is to deny that you really want Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. Today, would you give your heart to Christ? Would you come and place your membership in the church as God speaks to your heart? I'm going to pray. We'll remain seated. And then we will begin the invitation. We'll remain seated and pray. But get up from where you are and come. Pray at the altar. However God speaks to you, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful woman. What a wonderful woman of faith. May we be a church of faith that is bold in believing the impossible to be done because we're so desperate for something to be done. Oh God, in this invitation time, may some desperate things take place that will result in great, great victories in your name.